we are going to let folks in here. Welcome, everyone. We will get started in just a second. Welcome everyone, we will get started in just a second. Kathleen, should we get started? Let's do it. Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for today's Lunch and Learn, investing in land, water, and parks. The Land for Maine's Future program has an outstanding record of success, preserving special places. Oh, something crazy happened to my screen, but now it's back. Uh, Preserving special places in all 16 counties, protecting Maine's natural legacy and boosting our state economy. But this crucial program lacks the funds to invest in our very, the very places and activities that make Maine, Maine. We are delighted to welcome a terrific panel of speakers today. Senator Kathy Breen will walk us through her bill to fund the Land for Maine's Future program and Maine State Park. That's LD 983. Thanks for being with us today, Senator. Then we will hear from Betsy Cook, Maine State Director of the Trust for Public Land, Jenny Cordick, Executive Director of Maine Outdoor Brands, Ellen Griswold, Policy and Research Director at Maine Farmland Trust, and Ben Martens, Executive Director of the Maine Coast Fishermen's Association. We have a big panel because they each have a unique perspective on the Land for Maine's Future program, which is really a testament to how broad the benefits of LMF are, and we're grateful to all of them. Welcome. Also on the line today are two of the advocates leading the LMF coalition, Eliza Townsend, director of the Maine chapter of the Appalachian Mountain Club, and Melanie Sturm, forest and wildlife director at the Natural Resources Council of Maine. Eliza and Melanie, thanks for being on hand to help answer any questions. My name is Kathleen Neal. I am the Director of Policy and Partnerships at Maine Conservation Voters and Maine Conservation Alliance. Our organizations represent more than 8,500 members and supporters dedicated to protecting Maine's environment and our democracy. MCA does that through education, collaboration, and advocacy, and MCV by influencing public policy, holding politicians accountable, and winning elections. A few technical notes for today's event. We will hear from each of our speakers and then tackle questions for all of them in the Q&A session at the end. You don't have to wait though. You can send your questions to me through the chat as they occur to you. I will keep track of the questions and then ask those of the speakers at the end. If you have any technical difficulties, you can message Will Sedlak through the chat function for help. This event is being recorded and the video will be posted on our website later this afternoon, where you can also find recordings of all of our previous Lunch and Learns. Thanks again for joining us. And Senator Breen, Senator Breen. It's a little delayed, so we will delayed. circle back to her. All right, that sounds good. Well, then we will go right into some of the many reasons to support LMF. So Betsy Cook, I will turn it over to you first to, uh, to share some of those uh, impacts. Great. And, and Will, we're gonna keep our slides going. They are 
Betsy's got a slide in there. Excellent. Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you so much, Kathleen. My name is Betsy Cook, and I'm the main director of the Trust for Public Land. And I'm so excited to see you all today um, to discuss why now is a critical time to invest in creating new parks, trails, and public lands in Maine. The pandemic has underscored that access to the outdoors is crucial to our quality of life. This past year, we've seen people flock to parks and outdoor spaces like never before to exercise, to reduce stress and anxiety, and to space safely spend time with our friends and family. The outdoors has often been our only place to go to connect with our communities. I know for me, things like a post-work picnic at Higgins Beach or a summer afternoon hiking at the Bethel Community Forest were literal breaths of fresh air in a really hard year. And I'm sure all you have your own examples of the way the outdoors in Maine have been your own breaths of fresh air. And the research backs up what we intuitively feel when we step outside. Parks and green space relax and restore us and keep us connected to each other. We know from research that just 20 minutes a day outside reduces stress and actually strengthens our immune systems. So on this beautiful main day, make sure to budget your 20 minutes in to get outside. The rate at which people have turned to the outdoors underscores the need. Camping across the country this past year was up 28%. Hiking participation grew by almost 17% and freshwater fishing grew by 9%. And I think I'm part of that statistic as I took up fly fishing this past summer. In Maine, the use of state parks shattered records. Maine state parks and public lands welcomed 3 million visitors this past year. That's nearly 100,000 more people than 2019. Camping rates increased by 8%. And one that really stood out to me, Bradbury Mountain State Park, which I've been to many times this past year, saw a 60% increase in visitation. This steep climb emphasizes that the demand is there for more parks and public lands. But in Maine, we don't have the supply to meet the needs of all Mainers. Maine has notably less public conserved lands percentage-wise than New Hampshire, even though our populations have similar sizes. Over 65% of Maine people don't have close to home access to public parks and lands. And lower income neighborhoods especially lack access to quality green space. We believe that every Mainer, no matter where they live, deserves access to the great benefits of our outdoors. And state funding from the Land for Maine's Future program is one of the only tools we have to ensure that all Mainers get this access and that we can create more parks and public lands. As Kathleen mentioned, the program is nearly out of money though. All the places I mentioned today, Higgins Beach, Bethel Community Forest, Bradbury Mountain State Park, only exist because organizations like the Trust for Public Land were able to utilize Land for Maine's Future funding to create them. We have new parks and public lands ready to be created, ready to benefit Mainers, but we need the funding to do it. So as we work to recover from the pandemic and heal collectively in the months and years ahead, we must invest in the outdoors to ensure all Maine people have access to parks and public lands. Thank you so much, Betsy, for, for laying the, the foundation there. I understand that Senator Breen has joined us. So we're gonna go back and, and Senator, if you could tell us a little bit about LD 983, the legislation you have introduced to fund the Land for Means Future program. Um, Betsy gave us a great rundown of, of why that's so important. And I have a feeling that, that you're, your observations about the benefits of Maine's incredible outdoor places resonate with a lot of us, um, certainly certainly with me. Um, but let's go back to the sort of table setting for the bill overall. Senator Breen, thanks for joining us. Thank you so much, Kathleen. And thank you to Will for his technical assistance in getting me into the Zoom. I apologize for being a little late. Um, I have a long relationship with LMF starting from when I was a town councilor in Falmouth when we undertook our open space 
conservation program in uh, 2007. Um, I also have a number of LMF funded projects that were threatened, um, who had gotten approval and had, had been approved for grants um, during the LePage administration, and then um, had to really go to bat to make sure that those programs were uh, completed and then ultimately reimbursed by LMF. Um, so it's a program that um, I have worked with as a policymaker now for a long time, and it's very near and dear to my heart. Um, I know that there are a lot of people in Maine who share my commitment to open space conservation um, and all the benefits that it brings, who would really like to see us develop a standing funding mechanism where we have uh, over year after year, a, a some sort of source of, of uh, funding that just continues year after year that and that we wouldn't have to be going through this bonding process. Um, I completely support that. I completely agree with that. And we're not there. Um, so at the moment, um, we still are in a position to um, fund our Land for Maine's Future program through issuing bonds in the bond market. And um, the way that you do that is you have to put a, you have to get a bill through the legislature. Um, it requires a two thirds majority. Um, and that has been a, a tough hill to climb over the last couple sessions. Um, and then once it passes the legislature, it goes to the voters. Um, these bond issues, uh, once they get to the ballot, they have been um, strongly supported, uh, bipartisan in all regions of the state. You've probably said already there are LMF projects in all 16 counties. Um, and the program is very, very popular with the main public. Um, so hopefully we will get there this year. Um, Last session, I was hopeful that we would get the bond to the finish line, but of course we adjourned early in March because of COVID and we were never able to get back. So we had to start over this year. Um, so my proposal um, has about 60 million for uh, Land for Maine's future. And it also has, I believe 20 million for um, parks. Now, um, the good news is that the recent American Rescue Plan Act, also known as ARPA, um, includes some money for parks. So um, my bill might get amended to remove the money for um, parks, but we'll see. Um, and then the other thing is folks in this community probably know that there are there was the Great American Outdoors Act that was passed at the federal level um, that President Trump signed in August. And that also um, presents a big, big opportunity for land conservation. However, a lot of that money rests on a state match. So um, as folks, this is a little wonky, but you can't use federal money to match federal money. You have to have state money. The states have to have skin in the game. And that's why passing LMF is so important because if we have state money available, we can leverage a lot more federal money for projects. Um, and uh, because of the Great American Outdoors Act. And as, and as many folks know who've been involved in uh, land conservation, you know, it takes a, every little one, everyone is like a miracle where different parties come together. There's usually a time, a clock ticking, um, and it takes a variety of partners to get things done. And it's an LMF is the way that the state of Maine is, shows its partnership and um, invest in these projects for the state. Thank you so much, Senator. And I, I love that this is the way we show our, our partnership. I think that the diversity of our panel today, uh, your leadership on this, and the fact that 
actually just shortly before we we began this program, Governor Mills announced her bond package and, uh, and said in honor of George Smith, it dedicates $40 million over four years to conserve land and waters for Maine people through the Land for Maine's Future program. This is a program that, that matters to a lot of us. And um, I'm just so grateful for your, your leadership. Uh, Betsy gave us a great rundown of some of the, the restorative benefits of getting outside, but of course, LMF is also good business. Uh, and we have Jenny Cordick, the executive director of Maine Outdoor Brands with us today. Jenny, what does outdoor recreation have to do with our state economy? Hi, Kathleen. Thanks for, thanks for having me and um, great to see you, Senator Brain. Thank you for your leadership on this, on this important issue. Um, yeah, so my name is Jenny Cordick. I'm executive director of Maine Outdoor Brands and would love to kind of, speaking of, um, of wonkiness, dive into the economic benefits of outdoor recreation. Um, but Maine Outdoor Brands is an alliance of 125 outdoor product service and retail companies in the state. Um, so all of our members are helping facilitate an outdoor experience in some way. And that includes designing, um, products and, and manufacturing gear that we use out, outdoors. It includes selling, selling outdoor gear and equipment, um, providing services, and making that direct connection, connection to the outdoors. Um, so our, our goal really as, as an organization and as an alliance is to grow Maine's $3 billion outdoor recreation economy. We have 40,000 people that work in the outdoor industry in Maine. It contributes 4.2% um, to our state's economy. That's double the national average, and that's the fifth highest out of any state in the country. So when we look at these numbers and when we look at like what we have around us in Maine, right? Um, we really see outdoor recreation as a competitive advantage for the state and something we should be investing in, which is why you know, we're so supportive of, of Land for Maine's future. We know that Land for Maine's future has a proven track record of establishing trails, of making the coast more accessible, of protecting land all across the state. We see this as something that's really important for the long-term health of the outdoor industry. And it's, it's kind of self-evident, right? But all of our outdoor recreation businesses depend on having people go outdoors. So um, having, having places for people to use outdoor products, um, areas where people can go hiking, camping, biking, fishing, right, whatever it might be, we really do need public access for outdoor recreation. And, and Betsy you know, spoke to just what we've seen during the pandemic. And uh, I think it just underscores the need to be investing in the outdoors more than ever, right? We've had so many people get outdoors, a lot of newcomers, which has been really great to see. And that has been a boost to our outdoor recreation industry um, in what otherwise has been a pretty tough year. So, um, and like, we're expecting this demand to, to continue, right? Um, this summer, I think is gonna be a really busy year for outdoor recreation. And I think it underscores the need for us to be planning for the future. Um, Maine is, is in a great position to help meet rising demand for outdoor recreation goods and services. Um, but we have to continue to invest. So I, I also, I guess, just want to hit on a couple broader issues too that I, that I, that, that, that the state is facing that I think connect back to land for Maine's future. Um, one of them is, is workforce, right? We're having a big workforce shortage across the state and we know that we need to be attracting talent. We know that we need more young people in the state of Maine in particular. Um, so we could, we could really be thinking about investments in the outdoors as a talent attraction tool. So having parks and trails and water access is going to, be, is going to help make main towns more desirable places to live and work, uh, which can help recruit new residents and attract the talent that we all desperately need. Um, and then in, a, in addition to that workforce piece, I think entrepreneurship is, is something else that's pretty compelling here um, and, is, and is connected uh, for us, you know, back to these recreation investments. So how are we creating jobs and strong main companies in the outdoor industry? Um, the outdoors of Maine and the desire for, for 
others to enjoy. It was the inspiration um, for the founding of a lot of our outdoor brands here. So like L. Bean, of course, is a great example, but we also have a number of startups in, in the state that are working to grow and scale. Um, one, one example I'll just give in particular is a company called Foothill Fuels. And uh, you know, their founder um, spent a lot of time outdoors backpacking in Maine and saw a need to create a more sustainable um, camp fuel, right? One that wasn't petroleum based, that um, didn't have the you know, disposable can canister. So he created a new product, um, a camp fuel that's made out of vegetable waste and is working to, to grow and scale that company. And he wouldn't have, have had this idea if he wouldn't have had this um, formative experience in the outdoors of Maine. So ultimately it comes back to having outdoor experiences. Um, Maine is a great place to, to test products and come up with ideas um, that support entrepreneurship and innovation. And, and that's, you know, it's something we see as a direct connection here. So I think um, I'll sort of stop there, but I just want to underscore how, how timely this is as we think about, you know, what, how do we recover and rebound from the pandemic and what makes Maine unique? Um, what are the growing industries that we should be investing in and, and supporting? And for us, it comes back to outdoor recreation. Um, so I'll, I'll stop there. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much, Jenny. It, it really is just fascinating. And of course, we, we all know sort of intuitively how many Maine people uh, spend time outside, earn their livings outdoors. Uh, recreation is a big piece of that, but, but it's just a piece of that. And, um, and Ellen Griswold is with us from Maine Farmland Trust. Ellen, tell us what LMF means to Maine farmers. Yeah, thanks so much for having me today. Um, so I think a lot of people in Maine understand that agriculture is really a key component, not only of Maine's economy, but really Maine's way of life. Um, but unfortunately, farmland in Maine, which is really the foundation of our farm businesses, um, is very much a precious and, and limited resource. Um, so we know that agriculture in Maine contributes over 3.6 billion in terms of economic impact and supports over 27,000 jobs. Um, but between 2012 and 2017, the last two years that the USDA did its Census of Agriculture report, Maine lost 10% of its farmland. So that's over 145,000 acres of pasture land, cropland, um, woodland, and other important agricultural lands. Um, so obviously in this context, um, farmland protection is, is really critical, um, not only for ensuring that we have the land base for our farm economy, but also because it's a really important tool for increasing the financial security of farmers um, and for increasing farmer access to land. So when you compensate farmers for placing an agricultural easement on their land to protect it, um, it provides them with some compensation to reinvest in the farm, to pay off debt, or to obtain some savings before passing the farm on to the next generation of farmers. Um, and once land is protected and it's valued at its agricultural value, it makes the land much more affordable for other farmers to purchase, particularly beginning farmers. Um, we're really lucky in Maine that we have a growing number of beginning farmers in the state but access to land is a huge issue for our next generation of farmers. Um, and you know, protecting land is also a key natural climate solution um, by avoiding the emissions that are associated with developed land, um, by providing the land base to ensure food security for our state, because we know we will see supply chain disruptions as a result of climate change, the impacts of climate change in other parts of the country and really by preserving the climate benefits that can result from farmers using climate smart agricultural practices on the land. Um, but to achieve all these benefits, we have to ensure that there's sufficient farmland within the state. Um, and so the LMF program has been a really important source of public funding for protecting farmland within the state. Um, Maine Farmland Trust is really grateful for the financial support that the program has provided to protect um, about 10,000 acres within the state. Um, 
But at the same time, you know, we also recognize that Maine is really not keeping pace with state funded farmland protection efforts in other states in our region. So American Farmland Trust puts out a report every year on the status of public or state funded farmland protection efforts across the country. Um, and Maine ranks second lowest in the Northeast in terms of the number of farmland acres protected with state funding. Um, in fact, in the Northeast, the only state um, with fewer acres protected through state funding is Rhode Island. Um, but Maine has about 1.3 million acres of farmland and Rhode Island has 60,000 acres total. And in comparison, when you look at a state with a similar amount of farmland to Maine, like Vermont, um, they have been able to protect 746 farms and um, about 164,000 acres of farmland through their state funded farmland protection efforts. Um, so to us, it's just so critical that we refund this very important program um, so that we make sure that we are sort of um, preserving this critical resource um, within the state and that we're keeping pace um, with other states in our region. Um, and we're really, you know, we're really grateful to the leadership of, of Senator Breen and others who are really um, moving, you know, pushing this um, really important policy measure forward. Um, and I think it just also is important to reinforce that this will allow us not only to gain more um, state funding for farmland protection, but it'll also be allow us to leverage really important federal sources of funding as well as as private sources of funding too. Thanks so much. Makes sense. Thank you so much, Ellen. Um, you know, Right there in the name, the Land for Maine's Future program, folks probably aren't surprised to hear about the role that LMF plays in, in protecting working lands. Uh, but LMF also protects working waterfronts. And uh, Ben Martens is with us today from the Maine Coast Fishermen's Association. Ben, tell us what LMF does, uh, does in your world. Perfect, thank you guys so much for involving the fishing community in this conversation. It's um, it's also often a place where we get left out of because that disconnect between what happens on the ocean and what happens on land within our food systems is pretty stark within the state of Maine. Um, so I, I just do want to start with a, a quick little statement that um, you know one of one of my close friends and authors, his name's um, Bart uh, Barton Seaver, and he's a fa fabulous chef. He meet, recently moved to Maine, um, but he's really been a seafood advocate for, for his entire career. And he has this great quote where he says, food comes from farms, seafood comes from the ocean. And, um, or food comes from farmers and seafood comes from the ocean, right? And so like we have this disconnect between where our food is coming from when it's seafood and it's out over the horizon, it's off of the docks, and um, we've lost that connectivity between our seafood systems and our local food systems. And the working waterfront is where those two things run together and uh, come together in a way that people can appreciate, understand, and see. And so in Maine, um, we have got an abundant coastline. We've got over 3,400 miles of coastline in our state, but less than 20 miles of that is considered working waterfront. Mm -hmm. And out of those 20 miles, there's only 25 properties that are protected for working waterfront access into the future. Um, and that was through this program. This is the only program that we have in the state protect working waterfront properties. Um, there are different tax easements and things like that that people can put their uh, properties into when it goes into like current use. But uh, those are fairly uh, infrequently used. And if you actually want to think about how we invest in our working waterfront, how we protect that working waterfront access to the future, and when we start thinking about food in the way that Ellen talked about the need to protect our farmlands, you know, we have a fantastic opportunity in the Gulf of Maine to harvest sustainable, responsible seafood. And we often lose that opportunity because the seafood is landed in other places. We've got boats in Maine that are landing in Massachusetts and Rhode Island and New Hampshire and not coming across the docks in Maine because of that lack of access, because of the loss of access within their local communities. And so, you know, the Land for Maine's Future program, it's, it's not 
It's not perfect when it comes to working waterfront. There's still a lot of pieces of this equation that we are, are working on to, to fix and try and right size for the different problems that we're facing. But it is a tool and it is a crucial tool that has been used in places to protect important working waterfront. Like in Harpswell, there are two properties that are protected and we know that we're always going to have working waterfront access in Harpswell. In Port Clyde, they, uh, they have a working waterfront infrastructure there that they were able to protect, restore, and uh, innovate on so that they were able to create deep water access so that boats that catch groundfish like cod and haddock and flounder are able to land there still. And that is the furthest port east that we still have groundfish landings coming in in Maine. Um, and it's because they made those investments in the people in the place to allow that access and the flexibility of business planning. And so I, I think that a couple of the pieces that I, I just wanna kind of circle back on and, and stress is that you know, the working waterfront is weird and it's different and it doesn't fit into the normal conversation when it comes to protecting, protecting lands, but it is access in the same way that farmland is access. And it is a important component. If you wanna access the, the ocean, you have to have a place to come back to shore. You have to have a place to leave from. You have to have the safe harbor to come back to. And this is, this is our opportunity in Maine. Um, you know, Ellen and, and Betsy and Jenny have kind of talked a little bit about what makes Maine special. Well, there's nothing that makes Maine more special than our seafood. Um, whenever you talk to somebody, when you meet them, you say, oh, you're from Maine. They're like, oh, you know what I love? Lobster. And um, that's just part of our cultural identity as a state. And it's one of the things that we can really lean into when we think about our future and how we want to be building sustainable seafood, how we want to be building a sustainable food system and how we have this fantastic protein source just out over the horizon that we often land and ship out of our state. And so I, um, I just wanna stop there and just leave it at that. And that like, this is about food, it's about food uh, security. It's about thinking about how we connect people to our oceans and to our land and to our communities. And the Land for Maine's Future Project uh, program, whether it's access to recreation, access to farmland, access to our working waters, is one of the only programs like it in our state. And it's something that we desperately need to move forward with if we wanna protect kind of the soul of, of who we are as a community in Maine. So thank you guys for including us and uh, look forward to answering any questions that people have as we move into the next phase of the conversation. Thank you, Ben. You know, it's it's really true from, from heritage industries like fishing and farming to outdoor recreation and, and all it brings to Maine people, not to mention the significant economic benefits across the board. Uh, LMF is a pretty incredible program. So we, we have a bunch of great questions already and you can keep sending those to me through the chat, but, but before we get started on them, you all know that we, we like to share a call to action, a way for each of you to get involved in the topic of the day. And there's a, it won't surprise you that what we really need today is for everyone on this program to, to reach out to your state senator, your state representative, and express your support for LD 983. LD 983 would authorize a general fund bond to fund the land for Maine's future. And if it's approved by the legislature, then we'll all get a chance to vote for that on that bond in November. And as Senator Breen said, LMF has been incredibly popular with Maine people, but before we get a chance to speak, we need our lawmakers, we need two thirds of the legislature to, uh, to, to speak and to support this bill. So we need each of you to reach out and, and let them know what you think. We will send a link in the follow-up email that you'll get later this afternoon to make that super easy. And thank you in advance for, for clicking through, for sending those emails and for doing everything you can to make sure the LMF bond is on the ballot in November. Now, let's ask some questions. Ben, first let's go back to, to you. What does working waterfront preservation look like? Give us a sense of, of what LMF, like what are the nuts and bolts of, of LMF for working waterfronts? Yeah, I mean, so, We've got a, a wide variety of what we tend to define as working waterfront uh, from our organization. And so we've got the docks, we've got the piers, we've got the infrastructure like bait um, and um, access. 
And so, and then we've also got the, for the clamors and for those that work in the intertidal, um, it's being able to protect access points where they can walk in and, and get access to um, the mudflats. And that's, that's something that, you know, recently we've had a number of issues where, um, you know, it's, it's shared use issues with um, fishermen can't get access in the typical ways to the working waterfront or the mudflats. Um, and we have either, you know, new residents to Maine or we have new technologies coming into the working waterfront to try and um, help fishermen figure out how to get around um, limited access. And now we're starting to see conflict come up in those places. And so ensuring access to the intertidal is one piece of, of this work, but you know, really where it comes down to like the biggest and greatest impact is we have working waterfront in infrastructure uh, that our docks and piers and um, they are starting to crumble and they are starting to be owned by people who are getting up in age and trying to figure out how they transition those things into the future. And um, the value of those properties is skyrocketing right now. And it's because we're seeing a lot of um, increase in development. We're seeing a lot of new people moving into Maine. Um, just over the past year in the mid coast area, I think property values have gone up 30%. And so if you start thinking about how we protect and preserve working waterfront, um, it's, it's creating these types of programs and opportunities so that fishermen can um, think through future planning around these things. And they don't have to make the hard decisions um, at some point or the next generation doesn't have to make a hard decision about the, the greatest and best value of those working waterfront access points. That's really helpful, thank you. Uh, and then Ellen, sort of similar question for you. What are some farms that have gotten LMF funding? I know my local farmer's market opens tomorrow and I'm wondering how many of those farmers that I'm gonna see for the first time in a, in a while uh, have LMF or are connected to LMF in some way? Yeah, so um, LMF has protected about 42 farms throughout the state. Um, and they really sort of a, encompass a range of different types of production from, you know, veg organic vegetable production to dairy farming to some really important orchards that um, people are probably very familiar with, like Randall Orchards. Um, so it's, it, that has been a really great aspect to the program is that it has been able to support all different types of agricultural production um, within the state. Um, and then it's also, you know, there have been um, instances where um, LMF funding has gone to a land trust to actually purchase a farm that is then, you know, um, rented to um, a farmer with a, a long-term lease. So broad turn farm is, is a great example of that. Um, and another sort of model for providing um, farmland access, which is, which is great. Okay, super interesting. And then a, a question to all of you, what, um, what are your favorite LMF properties? You know, probably better than, than the rest of us. Where, where the special places are that this program has helped preserve. So what do you recommend? Give us your, give us your secrets. Betsy, you wanna kick it off? Absolutely, yeah. What a, a great question, a fun one to answer. And um, so for me, I'm really, I'm struck by um, how many local places are protected through the Trust for Public Land, really by communities, um, especially community forests. If you look at um, the places that have been created through LMF, there's Bethel Community Forest that I mentioned, the Down East Lakes Community Forest in Washington County that we're working to expand right now, um, and Blackstrap Community Forest in Falmouth. It's a pretty phenomenal um, representation of the ability for communities themselves to come together, um, take a hold of their backyard and their local forest land and create um, something really special. Um, so to answer your question, I would say for me, the Bethel Community Forest is really top of the list. Um, and for a couple of reasons, I mean, it's just become in the two years since it's been created, such a destination for folks to come together to connect there's a great trail race out there um, in September now. Um, high school students were just planting trees out there. Um, I was there this summer and folks from all over the state were 
just looking to get outside. Um, so that's, that's one, you know, don't, there's some pretty iconic places like Tumble down state park at Mount blue state park or, um, but don't sleep on the, on the backyard, um, places that LMF protects too. I love that. Thank you so much, Betsy. Jenny, how about you? Do you have a, a favorite? I think it's always hard to pick favorites, but I have been getting more into mountain biking this past year. And so it's been fun to discover some of the LMF properties that um, have, have nice mountain biking access. I think um, Betsy mentioned Bradbury, right? And I'm in the greater Portland area. So um, the Presumpscot River Preserve as well. Um, and one thing I'll just share, you know, we are just from what, what we've been hearing, um, from some of our service providers and, and land trust partners and, and brands, right? We're gonna have another really busy summer for outdoor recreation and people getting outdoors. And so it's gonna be a really great summer to, to continue to discover new places to go. And so um, I think that's that's a, a plug I'll put, I'll put in. If you're not even kind of really sure where LMF properties are around the state, it's, it'll be a fun um, spring and summer uh, to, to discover some new places. Absolutely. And Melanie and Eliza, I wonder if, if one of you has that link handy that I know there's a great way to, to find um, LMF properties on online. So if, if you have a chance to drop that link in the chat, that would be terrific. Um, Senator Breen, do you have a favorite LMF property? Well, it's a little bit like picking my favorite child, so I'm a little hesitant, <laughs> but um, one of them that I am kind of just getting to know myself that's in my district is the Knights, uh, Knights Pond Preserve in Cumberland. Um, it is just a, a gem, you know, I never knew about it until it got kind of embroiled in some controversy over LMF which eventually got settled, but um, it, it, considering that it's in Cumberland County um, and Penny Asherman is here, she's, she's part of the Shabi Cumberland Land Trust and she was part of that partnership that made that project happen. Um, but the, it's just an amazing place where you feel like you're in, you're so far from civilization and you're not. Um, but it's got an enormous pond and in the winter it ices over and the community keeps it shoveled and people play pond hockey on it. Um, and there's all sorts of wildlife and it is just, you, you just feel like you're really, really far away. And um, it's very, very easy to get to. There's a parking lot now and um, it's really fabulous. So keep that in mind if you want something quick and, and nearby Portland. I love that. And, and thanks for the shout out to, to Penny Asherman. We are so lucky to have Penny as the, the president of Maine Conservation Alliance board. So we know very well just how, uh, how incredible it is to have her behind any good project you're working on. Uh, ben or Ellen, did you want to jump in with a favorite spot? Sure, I'll, I'll jump in with two. And so the first one is just close to home. I live in Brunswick and um, we've got the, the Crystal Springs Farm protected area um, that used to host our, our uh, farmer's market. And then there's a bunch of trails and it's just, it's such a beautiful picturesque place um, that, you know, when I, I, I went to boat and I ran cross country there and that was just one of the favorite runs that we were able to go do and experience and, and kind of um, get to really know Maine through. So that's a very special place to me personally. And then, um, you know, I, I mentioned this place earlier, but on the working waterfront side, um, the Port Clyde Fisherman's Co-op, if you have not taken the adventure down to Port Clyde um, in your travels throughout Maine, um, it's on the St. George Peninsula. It is just one of the most iconic and picturesque working waterfronts that you can imagine. Um, and it's, you know, just to highlight one of the opportunities that the work that Land for Maine's Future has is so, um, they were able to take money and reinvest it and create a lot more value for the fishing community down there by shoring up that piece of property. And they never would have been able to do that. Um, even though that's a, it's a co-op, it makes money, but for them to take out a loan means that they would need to get um, flood insurance. And so this is a working waterfront property. It is meant to be flooded, uh, but 
you have to have flood insurance if you have a loan, a federal, a federal loan. And the flood insurance would be an additional thirty to $50,000 a year on a property that is meant to be uh, flooded. And so that type of impediment to investing within a community and a working waterfront means that like this type of money and resources is really the only way that you can have innovation taking place um, where you need like significant funds to go into it because none of these fishermen um, have just like bank rolls of cash to drop. You need to take out loans, you need to do that kind of thing. And so Lands for Maine's Future really does drive innovation on the working waterfront as well, which is which is really a valuable uh, asset to this project. Yeah, and I would say it, Ellen. LMF has protected, you know, as I mentioned, lots of really wonderful farms throughout the state. Um, but one that definitely comes to mind um, is uh, Jordan's farm in Cape Elizabeth, um, particularly because it's, you know, a multi-generational farm um, in an area of the state um, with really high real estate values and a lot of development pressure. Um, and I think the funding that the family received through LMF really allowed the farm to continue as a farm. And I just think they're doing such amazing things on the farm now. I mean, not only the producing the really wonderful products that they're producing, but they have a restaurant on their farm now. They run a really wonderful farm stand. And when the pandemic hit and they switched online, they started um, including products from lots of different farmers um, throughout the state. And so I, I just think it's a great example of what a farm can do once it receives some financial support um, from a source like the LMF program. And that sense of solidarity too with other, with other farmers. And that's, that's really a great story. Thank you. Um, I'm curious about whether LMF is, is you, Clearly the LMF sites are unique and special to Maine. Is the program itself unique to Maine or are there other conservation programs that are, are similar that we are, that are a good sort of comparison point? I can, I can speak to that if you'd like. I, um, I think so. I believe that the Land for Maine's Future program was one of was very innovative at the time it was created. Um, and then other states have caught up and learned from Maine and, and in some ways maybe even surpassed um, in states commitments to funding for parks and public lands and farmland and working waterfronts. So um, to Senator Breen's point of the importance of passing a land for Maine's future bond now to, for, to fill back the funding to be able to make all these great things happen. That's really what we're focused on. But there are plenty of other states who have dedicated funding sources um, rather than bonds and at a higher level. And I'll also just reference, I think one of the really important pieces there that Senator Reed mentioned as well is there's significant federal funding available to states. Um, Maine has the ability to draw down $40 million or more in federal funding a year to do all this great work that we're talking about but we need state funding to unlock that. And other states are accessing that federal funding, pushing this work forward. Um, and you know, our motto is dear go. So I'm looking forward to Maine being out in front and leading again um, and really making sure that we have the state funding to pull federal money in and to um, continue to lead when it comes to outdoor lands. You're so right, Betsy. There's something that just doesn't sit right with hearing that we're we're not keeping pace with other states, right? We're used to being, we want to be the leaders. And so um, this is a really good opportunity for, for us to rise to the challenge and, and reclaim that, that spot. Uh, Senator Green, I wonder if you could help us understand the, the differences between your bill, LD 983, and I, I know it's not the only LMF proposal and, and now we have the, the governor's bond as well. Are there things we should know uh, about the differences or is it just however we fund LMF is a good way to fund LMF? The latter. Um, you know, there's my bill, I'm a Democrat, there's a Republican bill, and then there's a governor's bill. Um, and so, 
honestly, don't sweat any of that. <laughs> um, the most important thing is that we get get it a, a bond bill through the legislature. And I've said over and over again, I don't care if it's my bill. I'll get off my, I'll give my bill away. I don't care. Um, what we need is to get an LMF bond bill to two thirds and get it to the voters. And um, basically the, the difference is um, levels of funding. You know, my bill allows for LMF itself the, the entity to work in collaboration with other partners in the community, you know, and that, and that we can, we can do in the language, but for folks who are your call to action and for folks who are here to advocate, you know, the best thing is to, is to say, uh, please support LMF, please get it through the legislature, get it to the voters. This is the time it's important right now. Um, don't get hung up on which bill is which. That's a really clear and, and wonderful message. Thank you. The, the important thing is to get LMF funded. And, and bonds are the vehicle right now, but what are, you, what are you thinking about? What are other folks thinking about for permanent funding? Because it sounds like, uh, like we you don't know, need to be having this this discussion over you know, and over I, again. I, mean, I have been um, I've been very focused on my bond bill, um, and I chair appropriations in general, so I have a lot on my plate. Um, if there's a bill for a um, regular stream of funding that's in the legislature right now, that could be happening, and I'm just not aware of it. Um, I'm not sure if the it's discussions that are happening or if there's an actual piece of legislation. Um, you might know that Kathleen um, better than I do um, or somebody else. Uh, so um, honestly, I think that at some point, you know, well, I don't know, but you, 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 I think setting up a, a revenue stream is a great idea. It's all, of course, the, the issue is, well, whose revenue is it? <laughs> So, um, you know, that is a, that's a deeply political question that will get solved someday, I hope. That sounds good. That sounds good. And is there a role, and, and this is, Senator Breen, might be for you, might be for anybody who, who knows the answer, has a thought, wants to jump in. Um, where does private philanthropy fit into this, this equation? And is there a way that, that private investment can help unlock federal dollars or does it need to be state funding? Um, I know if we put aside the issue of federal funding, I'm gonna let somebody else answer that. But I know for sure that when a project gets LMF approval, it often unlocks a lot of private money that it otherwise would not because when a community or a certain area of the state is coming together for a particular project, when that project gets an LMF grant, it, it really, it means the whole state thinks this is an important thing to conserve. And so it will often unlock private dollars that wouldn't otherwise be unlocked. Um, but I'm gonna let maybe Betsy talk about the federal funding piece. Yeah, I'm happy to. And I, I'll build on Senator Green's point that the way to create new parks, public lands, working farms, outdoor recreation sites, working waterfronts, it's really um, requires every piece of wind behind the sails as possible. So the combination of state funding, um, federal funding, and uh, investment and support from private individuals and foundations is, is really critical um, to create these new places. Um, and I, I know that historically Land for Maine's Future has leveraged three additional dollars for every one dollar that LMF has given to a project. Um, so basically that means that um, it's, it's really powerful in a center Green said, unlocking other funding, and there's absolutely a critical role um, for private funders and foundations and supporters um, to play to, to be able to make these places and keep Maine the way it is. It's a pretty impressive return on investment, too. So 
that's a good number to, to have in the back of our, our heads as we're reaching out to, to lawmakers that this is a good investment. Um, as we're as we're winding down and thinking about the logistics where we've got our our uh, our links to help us find new LMF sites to explore this weekend. Is there access for for folks with mobility issues at most of those sites or is there an easy way to tell what's accessible and what's not? Does anybody? All right, well, there's a, a question for us all to, to figure out the answer to together and, and get back. Um, I think we have time for one more. LMF has a role, I, th I think, in, in helping us address climate change. Uh, does anybody have a, a thought about how that works and, and how LMF can be part of the state's climate action response? Um, I can say briefly, Kathleen, that um, it is part of the, you know, Maine won't wait um, set of recommendations um, because of the carbon um, sequestration that it offers and a whole host of climate benefits. But I can see Ben um, has turned off his mute. So maybe he wants to add to that. Yeah, from a super selfish perspective, um, not to throw any of our friends in the agriculture world under the bus because I don't always know what the uh, the local folks um, carbon footprint looks like. But if you think about the national scale impact of um, food and the carbon footprint um, within the food systems, especially the larger international food system that we all um, are forced to participate in, seafood is one of the most carbon friendly sources of protein that you can eat, especially some of the ground fish species that we um, land in Maine. And so, you know, if you're thinking about how you can kind of impact your own personal carbon footprint, um, having access to local sustainable seafood is a great thing to do if you can uh, replace some of those other sources of protein that might be coming from far away um, and might not be raised in uh, the, the best ways possible. So. Yeah, I was just going to add that um... So I was part of the um, Maine Climate Council's Natural and Working Lands Working Group um, and several of the recommendations that came out of that working group that were incorporated um, into the final climate action plan um, are very much related to the topic that we're talking about today. I mean, there's the goal of conserving 30% um, of um, Maine's lands by 2030. Um, but there's also other benefits I think that Ben was talking about and certainly within the farming sector, um, agriculture in Maine only accounts for about 2% of the state's emissions, but there are a lot of climate benefits that farmers can provide on their land from using climate smart practices, um, along with you know, the, the really important need to support a robust local and regional food system, because as I mentioned before, you know, climate change impacts are really impacting um, the ability to produce food in other parts of the country um, and the world. And so if we wanna make sure that we are a food secure state and a food secure region, it's really important that we um, make sure that our farms are resilient to the impacts of climate change and that we're making sure that our farms have land um, that they need to grow the food that we all need. Um, and the LMF program is, is a really important source of funding for that. Really well said. And, and Ellen, thanks for your work on that, um, that working group and the Climate Council and, and for, for all you're doing. Um, thanks to Senator Breen for, for introducing this legislation and for advocating for LMF. Uh, thank you, Betsy, Jenny, Ellen, Ben, for giving us a window into to all of the impacts of the LMF program. Thanks to Eliza and Melanie for being the backbone of the LMF coalition and being on hand today and, and quick to add links to the chat. And thanks to all of you for joining us today. Uh, you will get a follow-up email later this afternoon with some additional information about this bill and a link to make it really easy for you to reach out to your lawmakers. And, uh, and we'll be back in this space next Friday, May 14th, 
with Sean Latched, from the, who is the director of the Verson Power Astronomy Center at the University of Maine. He is gonna give us a little bit of a primer on astronomy. Um, Katahdin Woods and Waters National Monument was designated as the first international dark sky place in the state of Maine and in New England. So we're in a really good spot to, uh, to check out the night sky this summer and Sean will be here to, to give us some pointers. I hope you'll join us until then. I hope you have a wonderful weekend and thank you again.